Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Dunsky. I'm the executive producer of The Agenda with Steve Pagan. And uh, welcoming you back to another of our bi-weekly chats on foreign affairs with Janice Stein, the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. Say hello, Janice. Good afternoon to you, Dan, and good afternoon to all our viewers and readers and bloggers. <laughs> online, for everybody who's joining us online. Uh, Janice, uh, it, is, it has been quite a week until we get some of the questions that, are, uh, that, that start coming through. I thought I'd obviously start with what's on many people's minds. I'm going to read uh, the names, Raid Jasser and Chiheb Esegayer, uh, two people arrested yesterday, one in Montreal and one here in Toronto. Um, for um, allegedly uh, a plot to derail a VIA train on the New York City-Toronto corridor. Um, there was a, a um, um, the, the expectations emerging from their lawyers is that both, uh, the indications are that both will plead not guilty. Uh, what's the latest that you're hearing and what do you make of all these, um, of the latest, of, of the events of these last 24 hours? Well, um as you know, with an investigation done, it's really hard to get good information. Uh, the press conference yesterday uh, was, didn't really give us much in the way of good information. And there's one confusing piece, which I want to come back to in a minute, um, which I'm really having a lot of trouble understanding. If they won't talk, they won't say much more because it's an ongoing investigation. And once these two um, get legal help, I can assure you their lawyers are going to tell them as well not to say anything. So it's going to be a long time before we have anything that you and I would think is good, hard evidence. Uh, what's the confusing piece in this yesterday? And I, I, I say it, it, we may be in the world of what I call the missing comma. Uh, the RCMP in their statement yesterday talked about Al-Qaeda in Iran. There is no Al-Qaeda in Iran. Um, there are the remnants of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which fled across the border uh, into Iran, were put under house arrest by the Iranian government for a number of years, then released but closely monitored. Uh, we know uh, every intelligence agency in the world and the scholarly community knows uh, who this group is. Uh, and over the years, the most they've ever been allowed to do is launder money, do some logistics, uh, pass along some information. But they've never been permitted by the government of Iran uh, to, do in, to engage in operations, uh, to go live. So what is this? Is it Al-Qaeda comma in Iran that the RCMP was talking about? We can't tell because it was an oral presentation. So we don't really know. It's a press conference. Uh, is it, or if it's that, then I understand what they're talking about. But if that's the case, um, there's only two explanations for what happened. One is that this group went rogue and authorized an operation without the approval of the government of Iran. And we'll know quite soon um, whether that's the case. Or this is a real game changer, which I would find very surprising by Iran, that they would choose Al-Qaeda as an operational instrument. I, I, I agree with everything you've just said. Uh, my hearing of the report and then listening to it again and, and what's emerged since then certainly assumed that there was a comma mostly because I've never heard of an organization. There never has been an organization called Al-Qaeda in Iran in the same way that there has one been one in the Islamic Maghreb, say, or Al-Qaeda in Iraq. There's never been an organization. As you say, they fled from across uh, Iraq during the, during the war. And also, frankly, not just Taliban fled from Afghanistan, but some Al-Qaeda members fled from Afghanistan into Iran as well uh, within the last decade. So I think that I'm hearing it the way that you're suggesting it. Um, I don't, and, and I think that the RCMP said yesterday they went to, to some lengths to say that they are not pointing the finger at the state of Iran. So what does that then tell you? This and, it, and uh, they have good what we call signals intelligence, which means that they have a capacity to listen in and virtually map the communications. And as you're quite right done, they said this is not state-sponsored. That is not what they were alleging. So if it's not state-sponsored, what that suggests is that this group 
went rogue in some way if indeed the RCMP has evidence which directly links these two individuals to the to anybody operating uh, out of Tehran. What do you make of the actual allegation of the plot itself? Does it strike you as being um, a, a plausible uh, plan for an attack? Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you want to look for where infrastructure is so-called soft, easy to attack uh, in North America, it's uh, more, I, I think trains are an even softer target, frankly, than subway systems are for a whole variety of reasons. Airports are now increasingly uh, difficult to penetrate because of intense security invest investments that have been made. Not so on trains. So if you're seeking to cause disruption, and we saw that in Boston last week, you actually go for targets that have never been attacked before, where security is at best um, limited. You know, one of the um, attributes of a train trip from Toronto to New York, there are different ways you can do that, but you can board a train in Toronto and get off at multiple stops before the train actually crosses into New York without any security inspection at all. There is no security on the via train between Toronto and Montreal. There are never, no, I can't remember, and I've taken it so many times, I never remember any kind of baggage inspection or personal inspection on the train. So this is a very easy target. I think the RCMP pulled the plug, frankly, when they did, uh, because of what happened in Boston. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting, I had not thought about that. Go ahead, tell me more about that. Well, if there was any risk whatsoever that anything would, and in the current climate, after the bombings in Boston, that anything would originate from Canada and cross the border from Canada into the United States now, that, that was a risk that they simply could not take at this moment. Can, can you speak to that just for a split second? Let's broaden this discussion. Uh, for, for those of us who are watching, for those who are watching, explain just how important it is that the Canadian border that the border, excuse me, between Canada and the United States not thicken, and therefore that Canadian uh, government and agencies of the government will do whatever is necessary to make sure that the Americans do not start uh, becoming overly concerned about the, uh, the the border and what's crossing it. Well, you know, then this is an no-brainer for any government of any political persuasion, frankly, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, the cross-border trade between Canada and the United States is the biggest in the world. Um, depending on how you count, 50 to 60 percent of our GDP is dependent um, directly and indirectly on the trade we do with the United States. The United States still accounts for about 70 to 75 percent of our active trade. And a lot of it is what we call real time, uh, which means a Canadian company uh, in a supply chain with somebody in the United States. So take parts of our auto industry. That's probably the easiest way to illustrate it. You know, a car crosses the border eight times before it's finally finished. And you keep in stock just the infantry you need, because, and that's cheaper than stockpiling large amounts of infantry, because you're reasonably confident that car is going to get across the border in reasonable time. And we were moving very much in that direction before 9-11. Along comes 9-11 the border starts to thicken. And every prime minister we've had since then has used all his political capital to try to persuade the United States that the border is secure, that we do our job, and that no uh, terrorist will cross the border from Canada into the United States to commit a violent crime. So it's not, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that Canada's primary national interest is ensuring the relative ease of uh, transport across that border. It's hugely important to us. It's right. impossible to exaggerate the importance, frankly. Uh, well, then that, that does make, it, 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 it adds a lot of, uh, of evidence to uh, plausibility to your, your contention that that may be why the RCMP decided to act right now. Uh, Janice, I think that we're going to probably be talking quite a bit about the United States and Canada. I'm just taking a look at some of the questions that are starting to come in. 
Um, and uh, for instance, some people are talking about Keystone, but I'm going to hold off on that one because there is a question that has come up in about uh, the Boston, um, the Boston bombings, and uh, and it's and, and uh, it's from Alex, and Alex asks, uh, "What is your take, Janice, on on uh, Tsarnaev being tried in a civilian court, um, and originally not being Mirandized, and that is uh, not being read his rights?" Right. Uh, so let's take the second one first, and then we'll come back uh, to the uh, issue of the of Miranda of reading uh, an alleged criminal their rights before their question. So the bigger issue is: Do you try Chernyev in a civilian court or a military court? For me, it's a no-brainer. Um, this is an American citizen, unlike his older brother who was killed. He is an American citizen who committed a criminal act on U.S. territory. Uh, that is a matter for the criminal justice system inside the United States. Now, there are many people who allege that the criminal, and I think this is the case, that the criminal justice system could have dealt um, with many of those who have been charged with terrorism, non-U.S. nationals. But it's a black and white case when it's an American citizen. It would be a fundamental violation. Uh, you know, Senator McCain asked that he be declared an enemy combatant so that he could be uh, charged and tried in a mil before a military tribunal. That would frankly be an unprecedented violation of the fundamental rights of a U.S. citizen. So I'm not one bit surprised that Obama quickly moved uh, to say very clearly he's going to be tried in a civilian court. I think that was absolutely the right decision. Now, with respect to Miranda, there is what is called a public safety exception, that when legal authorities, investigative authorities feel there is a threat to public safety, uh, you can question a suspect without reading that suspect their rights, but you pay a price if you do it. Any confession or any other material that they give uh, can never be used in evidence against them in a trial. So it seems to me that what the calculate and, and what from everything we understand, and this happened in the hospital room, and we're relying on newspaper reports of what happened. So we should make that clear uh, to everybody who's in this conversation. We're getting second evidence once removed. Uh, what they did was invoke the public safety exemption to ask him whether there were any other imminent threat any other attacks being planned. Uh, when they were satisfied that there were no other attacks being planned, which is consistent with the public safety exemption, they then read him his rights. He did acknowledge in this early period that he was in fact the bomber, and that will not be, they will not be able to use that as evidence in any trial. I suspect they feel done, that they have so much evidence and uh, not only from the bombing of the finish line of the Boston Marathon, but from the shootout that took place at MIT, um, where a police officer was killed, that they do not need his confession. And, presume, and presumably from having um, uh, raided their apartments and where they were living and found other, as they said, explosives uh, and devices. But just coming back to what you were just talking about, uh, about trying them uh, in, the, in the criminal justice system, it, it, it does strike me as odd, though, that there are now three different um, categories of, of individuals. You've got people like the Tsarnaev, Tsarnaev who's going to be tried in the way that he's going to be tried. You've got enemy combatants who are um, still at Guantanamo Bay. And then you've got some Americans who are being killed by drones. Uh, and that's three very different levels uh, all of which have to do with NASA, NASA treating people th in three different ways, all of whom have to do with a similar national security threat. That's right. So let's take those three and let's see what distinguishes them. And I think each of us would have views about what's appropriate or not. In the case of Chennai, this is a U.S. citizen who committed a crime on U.S. soil. That's what makes it for me a no-brainer that he should be charged in the criminal justice system. The second case you mentioned is quite right, was a U.S. citizen, um, a um, Islamic preacher, militant Islamic preacher, uh, who allegedly was influencing others to create, uh, to commit acts of terror, and he was preemptively assassinated uh, by a drone attack. Uh, 
uh, that has provoked huge controversy uh, among lawyers in the United States. And um, I think uh, it's not defensible, frankly. Uh, the third case that you mentioned. Now, one of the one of the one of the arguments that people would use against what I just said is that he was in a country, Yemen, where he was inaccessible, and there was no possibility that the authorities would turn him over to any kind of criminal investigation. So he was able to operate to continue operating, and there was zero possibility that in fact Yemeni agents on the ground would intervene uh, to arrest and remove his capacity to incite acts of terror. So that's the legal justification that was given for, uh, by the Obama administration for that preemptive, because it is assassination. Uh, drones are tools of assassination. The third group are people um, originally, uh, allegedly affiliated with Al-Qaeda, um, with the original attack. Uh, arrested immediately after, often um, in, involved in processes of rendition where they were questioned in countries like Egypt and Syria that are uh, infamous for the kinds of methods that they use, and then shipped to Guantanamo Bay. As you know, when President Obama came to office, he wanted to close it, which meant that he had to be able to do two things. He had to be able to return those uh, to their home countries with the assurance that there would be a trial, or that they would be imprisoned, and that they would be imprisoned if convicted. And many governments have refused to accept these people back. And or they had to be tried in the United States. And there were members of Congress that were adamantly opposed uh, to trying any, you know, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, Khalid Mohammed, uh, one of the original uh, designers of 9-11. They were adamantly opposed to having a trial in New York City or anywhere else. Uh, in the United States because of that. And I think part of that was fear about the kind of target that would make if a trial were held in the United States. So the president had, in a sense, not been able to move on Guantanamo Bay. But this is the most, this is the clearest case. This is a U.S., if it had been his brother, by the way, who had been alive and the younger brother um, had been shot, I would imagine that the legal arguments would have been a lot more heated. This is a U.S. citizen committing a criminal act on U.S. soil. There should be no discussion. No. And I think we should also point out that in the cases of those who are in Guantanamo, I don't believe that there are any U.S. citizens. No. In fact, there are no U.S. citizens. No. Absolutely not. All right, let's move on. Uh, Janice, uh, just bringing it back to the, um, the, uh, the, the VIA plot, um, as it's already been called, uh, a question um, from Nigel, uh, asking about the RCMP press conference yesterday, tying... Um, Al-Qaeda uh, to Iran, and he's suggesting that it smacks of uh, the WMD in Iraq, fear and warmongering. Do you suspect that there was some of that going on in what the RCMP was talking about? No. Look, um, the RCMP would be putting its head in the noose, frankly, if it went out and gave a press conference like that uh, without evidence that it will ultimately introduce into a legal process uh, that these two people will be involved in. So they have to have what we would call signals intelligence, which comes from eavesdropping and monitoring, cell phone communications, uh, th that whole set of digital media, uh, which are quite easy to monitor and to observe. They must have something or they never would have said what they did. And those communications somehow go back to Iran. Uh, so that's the mystery here, because we agree there is no al-Qaeda in Iran, uh, but there, may, there must have been operatives that were somehow in contact with these people. For me, the interesting question is, um, if they did what they've done before, which is launder money, uh, provide logistical help, um, and they couldn't have been very successful at it, by the way, because, uh, as we know, the RCMP have been following these people for a year. So whatever they were getting uh, wasn't very good. Uh, but if they did that kind of thing, yes, that's what al-Qaeda in Iran at the most has ever been able to do. They've never been able to really go operational. And that's why I think that 
they are in the back, at the most they're in the background here. Do you suspect, uh, Janice, that uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I wonder if you know enough about the, and you know enough about a lot of things, about the Iranian security services to speculate as to whether or not there may, this may be an indication of a split, um, which we've sometimes seen in Pakistan, for instance. Is there any indication that uh, the, the officials organs of the, the Iranian state, who have been very clear in, uh, in, in denying any involvement in this whatsoever, um, that there may be a split and that a, a smaller group may actually be operating in a rogue way and authorizing these kinds of operations. Admittedly, this is pure speculation, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just, if you know about the, the Iranian regime enough to know if this is possible. Yeah, well, let me speculate with you. And again, let's remind everybody um, that is talking with us that we're speculating here. Uh, but that's certainly a possibility. And it was one of the first things that occurred to me when I listened uh, to the press conferences. And I said, I wish there was a text that they released. Uh, with a comma or without a comma, because I would have helped a lot. Um, but it's entirely possible. First of all, that we know there are deep divisions within the security services inside Iran. We have some that are loyal to the president, uh, Ahmadinejad, who is now in a fierce struggle before the elections in June uh, um, to make sure that his chosen successor prevails against Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, who, does, who has another candidate, another horse in the race. So there are fierce splits, and around each of these men, there are security services. So uh, secondly, as you know, we have the regular forces inside Iran, including the Republican Army and the Republican Army, and then we have the Al-Quds forces, uh, and then we have militias uh, that enforce order in the street. So there are deep splits within the security services. I'm still, all that's true, Dan, but I would still be surprised if anybody would choose Al-Qaeda as an instrument. The only reason to do that would be to embarrass the government of Iran. Hmm. Oh, that's a very good point. Uh, Janice, I'm going to bring us back to North America. We said that we were talking about uh, cross-border issues, and we have been discussing cross-border issues. And I want to leave the Boston plot and, uh, uh, excuse me, the Boston bombings and the VIA plot for a moment and go west um, to Alberta and discuss the Keystone Pipeline because that has been, I mean, it's never really gone out of the news, but it's back in the news. And our question uh, is from Dan W. And he's asking, uh, is the U.S. decision on Keystone as fundamental to the future of the Canadian-U.S. relationship as the feds and the government in Alberta are making it out to, uh, to be? It's a very, very important um, issue for the province of Alberta and, by the, of course, for the federal government. You know, a big chunk of this government comes from the province of Alberta, uh, number one. And number two, uh, the oil industry is crucial to the future of Alberta, but it also has a big impact forward and backward in the province of Ontario, in the province of British Columbia, uh, because Ontario manufactures and supplies some of the equipment uh, that is used uh, in the oil sands. So yes, this is a big one. And why is it a big one? Uh, Alberta is getting a very heavily discounted price for its oil because it cannot get its oil to market. Uh, they are really, it choked uh, in the system. It is using rail, which is expensive, so there's an additional cost uh, to Albertan producers. Uh, and by the way, it's not safe. Rail is much less safe than pipelines, and new pipelines are safer than old pipelines, uh, where pipes deteriorate. So for the oil patch in Alberta, Keystone is a make it or break it. This is especially the case because the alternative discussions in this country are two. One, go west to British Columbia, and the Northern Gateway Pipeline is in a lot of trouble. I'm very dubious that it will ever be built. The alternative is to come east um, and to go all the way to St. John, and that will take some time. Uh, and although I think there's greater receptivity from some of the maritime provinces who are anxious uh, for the revenue, uh, it's a long time and it's greater distance. If your markets are in Asia, it's a tough case to make that you ship oil east across the country to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so this is a real big one. 
A lot of businesses have already said that. I mean, pipeline manufacturers are saying that they uh, they will do it. If that's the only way to get the Alberta uh, oil out to market, it's better to go east. Um, so in other words, somebody somewhere is making a market case for doing that, even though it's not the preferred option. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right, Dan, that uh, Alberta oil producers and pipeline manufacturers are determined to get the oil out. And so as this you know, huge environmental debate takes place in the United States, uh, and you may have seen that the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in Washington just released a document this morning or yesterday that was much more critical um, of the potential environmental problems of the pipeline than the State Department, uh, which released a, I, I, th I think, what you would call a blander document. Uh, so that controversy is going to heat up. Uh, the environmental movement in the United States has made this their signature issue because, you know, it's great you can get a yes or a no from the president on this one. Uh, and this, the decision is now postponed until September may drag on uh, into October. And it's one of these mobilizing issues that we're going to see over the next four months. Um, I have a quick question for you, Janice. Tell me, who, who carries more weight in Washington, the EPA or the State Department? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I would probably tell you the EPA uh, only for this reason, that uh, this is Obama's base. Uh, so it's, it's the politics of this. The State Department doesn't have a constituency in the United States. Uh, the EPA does have a constituency in the Democratic Party and the president. So, you know, we had, uh, you can tell me who it is, I can't remember the name right now, but we had a consultant up from Washington uh, yesterday saying, or writing in, the, in one of our newspapers, I don't know why Canadians are even worried about this, it's a no-brainer, Obama's going to do this. Um, you know, the Canadians are more worried than we in Congress are. Of course, this is going through. I actually think it's closer than uh, he thinks, and I think it's closer because of the politics that Obama is going to have to um, antagonize his own constituency. And I suspect what we're going to see done when fall comes is an approval of the pipeline tied to a set of environmental targets and performance. Uh, both in the United States and Canada, because he cannot simply write that constituency off when he's got high hopes for the 2014 elections. One last question on the border, Janice, and then I want to move on to the Middle East. Another question that just came in, and that is, what do you make of this proposal, uh, if we can even call it a proposal, this idea that's been floated out about charging Canadians um, who want to enter into the United States what, when they cross the border? What a dumb idea, right? That's all I could say about that. It's really dumb, and you could just hear the howls of outrage in Ottawa when that one um, came over the transom. Uh, if you're looking to raise revenue uh, and all the other issues that we have in common that we've just talked about, uh, from pipelines to better security along our border, you don't tax um, people who are doing business across the border and creating revenues and creating jobs and you don't tax tourists who want to spend time in each other's country. Frankly, go slap a, uh, a, a toll on a road uh, rather than do this. This is really a dumb idea, really dumb. Janice, uh, next question, uh, and this has come via our chat. Uh, Israel has said today that Syria has used chemical weapons in the past few months. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the case, what happened to the Obama administration's, uh, excuse me, the Obama administration's red line um, of no using, no use of chemical weapons? Yeah, this, um, you know, it's not only the government of Israel, which did make that statement today, uh, but the governments of France and Britain uh, 10 days ago uh, asked Ban Ki-moon to investigate charges that Syria has in fact used chemical weapons. Um, you know, this can prove to be um, very, very troubling for the Obama administration uh, if, in fact, the evidence uh, is brought forward. Now, just let, let me tell you where we are with the evidence. Uh, Israel has not released the evidence. Um, it will have to, frankly. Um, but there's a constraint on its doing so, which I'll come to in a minute. 
Ban Ki-moon has agreed to investigate, but he needs the permission of the government of Syria to let the inspectors in. The government of Syria has refused. So we do not have, again, just so we all know where we stand here, we don't have any independent verification that chemical weapons have, in fact, been used, number one. Number two, uh, for the Obama administration, once it's established that chemical weapons have indeed been used, it would be, I do not see how uh, they, they walk away from the commitment that they made. They made it so forcefully, Obama said repeatedly, this is a game changer. So to say that sarin gas, which is what the Israelis are alleging Syria used, is kind of just a um, you know, one up from tear gas is not quite right. Sarin gas was used in the attack on the Tokyo subway system, and people died from it. And I, the Israelis are clearly alleging that people died in Syria. So the challenge now becomes what constitutes evidence of that. Um, I can assure you that there are conversations going on right now between the United States and Israel uh, in which the conversation is very, very much, we have a whole set of issues together on the table right now. Uh, this is not going to facilitate many of these issues. Um, and that's probably why we haven't seen any evidence released. Why do you suppose then that Israel would have uh, made this announcement? What, what, what is Israel's interest in, in uh, quite apart from just a, a, a monitoring of the situation and announcing it for potentially humanitarian reasons or reporting reasons, but what's their interest in announcing this? I think it's important that uh, we understand the cultural context of chemical weapons. Um, in Israel, uh, there is a wholly different context around poison gas, gas, any kind of chemical weapons, which for the population of that country uh, evokes uh, Holocaust memories uh, almost uh, instantaneously. And so there is an absolute taboo as far as they are concerned on the use of chemical weapons of any kind. And I'm sure they took Obama at his word uh, that were there to be evidence of chemical weapons, there would be, and here's what we don't know, Dan, but let's think this through together. Uh, what will the United States do? What they would have to do is insert forces on the ground to secure those supplies of chemical weapons. That's not an easy job uh, in the midst of a, a fairly uh, competent Syrian army still, with a lot of firepower um, and uh, a civil war raging on the ground, uh, you're certainly going to be putting your troops at risk if you insert them on the ground to secure these 41 or 42 sites of chemical weapons. So I think there's just a, a very, very different culture about chemical weapons in Israel than in almost any other country in the world. Just like there's a very different culture around nuclear weapons in Japan than there is in any country in the world. It makes, it makes a great deal of sense. In fact, in, in one of our earlier chats that we had, Janice, a few months ago, we discussed the possibility of Russia uh, being uh, the, the power that would potentially go in and extract those weapons uh, from Syria, given that they have a base there and given that they are obviously, uh, they have closer, well, I don't know that that would help, but obviously Russia keeping Syria as a, in, in their sphere of strategic influence. You know, I think what would happen, you know, the Russians are, I still feel, our best position to go in and secure the weapons. Because what you really don't want, you don't want anybody, including the Syrian army, to have access to these weapons and use them against civilians. You know, the last time this happened uh, is there are two cases, uh, both of which the West turned a blind eye to, and both of which was a bad mistake when we did. One was when they were used against Iran by Iraq and against Iranian cities in the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. And secondly, when Saddam Hussein uh, gassed Kurdish communities, as you remember, uh, and the West looked the other way. And I think that was a, a serious mistake for which everybody paid later on. A lot of people must be wondering uh, uh, whether we will be hearing anything from the White House on this, uh, do you think that it is becoming increasingly difficult for the administration to avoid coming to a decision on Syria? I think we will certainly be, we will certainly hear something um, from the White House on this. They're going to have to engage with 
whether they think there's good enough evidence that Syria has used chemical weapons uh, against civilians. There are very good intelligence assets there done. Uh, there are, you know, we live in a world of social media. Um, there are pictures. You can tell a lot. You, we saw from Boston how much citizen pictures can actually tell you. Um, and that's the case too with chemical weapons. There would be burns of, uh, depending on the chemical weapon. There would be people sick in particular ways. Uh, discoloration of skin. Discoloration of skin. So there's certainly, there, there, there are traces that um, everybody is picking up one way or another on this. And I, I don't think the Obama administration can ignore it. Uh, Janice, uh, your, your mention of social media and uh, the topic has brought us nicely to our final question, and this is from Peter, uh, who asks, why is self-radicalization so difficult to track when YouTube chan channels are so easy to monitor? In other words, what he's saying is that, um, we, as you just pointed out, we live in a social media world. Uh, YouTube is, is uh, example number one when it comes to looking at evidence, uh, and yet we still find it so difficult. The answers are sometimes right in front of our noses. We just don't know where to look. So let's, let's actually look at the two situations because they're quite interesting. And, you know, we all suffer from what I call the needle in the haystack syndrome. When you're in the haystack, it's really hard to find the needle. Uh, beforehand when you're looking for it. When you know where the needle is after, ah, you say, why didn't we see that needle in the haystack? And that's with the Chernaya brothers. They were investigated. They were investigated before he traveled to Russia. Um, and really- Sorry, I think just to be clear, I just think that there was only the one that was investigated. The I'm older not... brother, the older brother, exactly. Um, they were cleared, uh, their activity on social media, you know, his activity on social media was monitored, done. There was nothing. Um, and the file, in a sense, just fell off the, the top of the pile. Usually where social media, and we saw this in the Canadian case, it's not the, of course, the law, you know, the authorities monitor all the obvious radical sites, but he wasn't going to them. So, Look at the Canadian case. What's really interesting in the Canadian case is an email came to uh, CSIS or the RCMP, we don't know which, and said, I have concerns about what one of the young people in our community is doing. I'm worried that he's radicalizing. That didn't come from social media. So it's, it's you know, authorities cannot, they would do nothing else but monitor social media nonstop all the time. And frankly, we may be moving into that world when the algorithms for big data get better than they are now and you can just track the patterns um, in a, without a lot of human time uh, involved. But what, it, you, what usually happens is somebody from a community steps forward, as this imam did, and said, I'm worried about what I see this person doing. And as you've been saying, uh, really for 12 or 13 years uh, now, um, that is probably the most important thing uh, that can happen when moderate voices uh, do begin to say, not in my name. That's right. And you know, yesterday, again, to come back to this, because I think this is important for our community, the fact that the RCMP chose to assemble 20 um, Islamic religious leaders and thank them publicly for the kind of support they have given um, in this investigation, really says, you know, that those pictures say better than anything that the RCMP said in words. Um, we do not want to marginalize and stigmatize our whole community. In fact, this community is our partner in this struggle. Janice, as always, uh, time always flies when we are, are joined uh, uh, by you here, and we'll do it again in a couple of weeks. Uh, let me just, before I thank you officially, uh, remind people that tonight on the agenda we're going to be looking at women in politics. Um, Premier Kathleen Wynne, who is a woman in politics, uh, will be joining us for that conversation. And also Friday, I'm quite certain that the story of the week, well, uh, I'm not certain, but I have a hunch, a strong hunch, that the story of the week may very well be the continuing fallout of this VIA plot. Um, and so I hope that everybody who's at home and watching this or at work or wherever you're watching us joins us for that and everything in between. Janice Stein, the director of Monk School of the Monk School of Global Affairs, thanks again for joining us and we'll look forward to doing it again very soon. You're so welcome, Dan.